You're all set? Good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing this morning? Are we excited? Yes. yes. Okay. Let's see a raise of hands of who came the farthest to get here. Oh, okay, where did you come from? Michigan. Wow. <laughs> And we have two ladies from uh, over here from Virginia. Oh, all of you? Texas. Wow. What a great community. Does Oakland? Yeah. <laughs> so last year, my sister and I came to this conference. It was the first conference. And we were looking for answers and a whole lot of hope. And at that point, my two sons had cut off all contact with me and weren't speaking to me, and I wasn't having any visitations with them. I had gone through a very bitter custody battle, and shortly after my divorce, my ex-husband married a woman who spent the next 14 years of my life trying to destroy me. She, uh, I had worked in mental health with severely emotionally disturbed children, and she did everything she could to get me fired from my position had me investigated by DCFS, left nasty messages on my phone, on my email, on my fax machine. She told my kids that I was a crack addict, that I lived in a halfway house, and that I was also a prostitute. She, uh, and because of her really bizarre allegations, I ended up with 10 years of monitored visitations with my children. When my oldest son turned 18, I said to my sons, you need to make your own decisions now. Here's my phone number and my address. You can call me and come and see me at any time. I had no idea how much control this woman had over my children. So I spent thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars, most of what I had on fighting this in the courts. No one knew what parental alienation was at that time, so there were very little resources. At one point, the judge looked at me and said, when I had asked for the monitored visitations to end, she looked at me and said, the kids are used to it this way. The end. The kids are used to it this way. Pull it. OK. Better? OK. Then when at the end, you can hear me sobbing louder, <laughs> which I promised I wouldn't do. So I have to tell you, I went through some very dark days that included several hospitalizations. Um, as many of you, my heart was broken into pieces. During this time, my twin sister, who badly wanted to have contacts with my sons, took it on herself to make contact with my sons. And so her game plan was to play along with the stepmother. She had her believing that she was completely on her side and that I really was the whack job that she said I was. So she actually convinced her to let my sister take our sons, my sons, to Michigan to visit my mother for a holiday. Well, two years ago, my oldest son went. At that time, he really refused to speak to her about me. He didn't want to talk about it, but he was very close to her, very huggy, very affectionate. He just didn't want to talk about me. Last year, we came to this conference, and we got so much information, so many resources, so much support. So she convinced her to let my oldest son, Alex, go last Easter. We spent an hour on the phone with Dr. Coleman before we left. And you're, hmm? OK. I, OK. Better? So we spent an hour on the phone with Dr. Coleman, like two days before they flew out. And uh, Dr. Coleman had advised my sister to let Alex have a few days to just kind of be with the family. Don't jump on him right away. Well. That lasted until about touchdown, <laughs> and my niece launched in, and it was a huge conversation. So Alex finally got to hear the truth about me. He was surrounded by my 18 cousins, my mom, my brother, my sister, all telling them loving things and what a lie everything had been in his life. So we still have Christopher. I'm still walking the same road that all of you are walking, so I am here to learn more to hopefully bring Christopher back in the fold. But last year, I came to this conference looking for answers. This year, I'm introducing you to Alex, my son. Yeah. 
<laughs> Alex and my twin sister Sally, who is there, are willing to answer any questions that you have how we played this game. We'll be available throughout the whole conference. But now the woman of the hour, um, I want to introduce you to the woman who is the CEO and president of the International Support Network of Alienated Families. She is an alienated mother. She has three degrees. She is the most loyal person you will ever meet. She is a warrior in the fight against parental alienation. And she is also my dear friend, Karen Lebo. Welcome. Susan, I wish my mother was here to hear that. <laughs> Friends and family and people I've spoken with on the phone, it's overwhelming. Now I get to see, uh, put names to faces, and what beautiful faces, and what a beautiful room. Yeah, I was concerned that we didn't have enough decorations. Can you imagine? <laughs> anyway, uh, the thing that strikes me is that uh, this is a, a place that is a historic monument. And women, uh, this has been a women's club since 1924. And it seems to me that it's not just back until 1924 that women gathered, but I would say millions of years that we have gathered for comfort, for support, to depend on each other, literally, for our survival. And what they say is what? What you cannot do yourself, you can do as a community. And uh, we started with three people three people in Santa Clarita in a living room. And look, we have people from uh, different states, different countries. <laughs> um, unfortunately, parental alienation syndrome is huge. And if you really look into yourself and your family history, you don't have to look very hard to find somebody that's been, a, been alienated or shunned, you know. So, um, Anyway, a hearty welcome to you. Uh, I want to deal with the most difficult issue we have today, which is the workshops. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I am responsible, the buck stops here, in assigning those workshops. We asked you to pick three, have three choices. Last year, we only had three choices. And so people, the only criticism that we got was that they wanted to go to more workshops. <laughs> so we doubled the number. And uh, at any rate, I will tell you, if you look through the, the list, each speaker is a jewel. Each speaker is, uh, is known in the field, and each speaker uh, is, has, is, is good to the core. How about that? Um, and articulate and easy to listen to. And that's by way of saying that, uh, that I know that there are most of the people in the room would like to change something <laughs> from what I get. And I would like you to allow yourself to have an adventure and maybe You'll, you'll connect with someone or hear someone that you would never have thought of hearing. The other thing is, is that uh, these are people that are available, not just here at the conference, but um, you may want to purchase a free consult, purchase, how do you like that, purchase a free consultation. Uh, for We have this new deal going that for $90, uh, that includes the admission as well as a, a free consultation, not with every every person, every presenter, but many. So at any rate, uh, I wish I could make it so I don't like uh, conflict, actually. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I wish I could do more than that. Uh, we have about 100 people here. And, um, and George, George was with me. We were talking about when it was 19, when we had a, a total of 19 people coming. 
And, you know, uh, so uh, this is truly amazing. And each one of you is truly amazing. I think I've spoken to most of you. Anyway, if you, um, if you have an assignment, uh, we are not, um, what, hard and fast. There is no, you know, if it, and you feel very strongly that you must see this person today. And there is a seat available. And you're a peaceable person, because I don't want to lose anyone over, you know, a fist fight or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, you may go to another session. You can do that. Um, but I would ask that you, uh, you know, or you're considerate of the entire group, and uh, that as much as I could, I did try to honor at least one choice. That's why we gave you three, saying that we would try to honor one. So, um, and, and if there was anyone in the, on the list that, uh, what, was uh, not worth hearing, they wouldn't be here. <laughs> so with that in mind, I'm going to introduce Brian. <laughs> yes. Brian Ludmir, I emailed actually uh, a bunch of folks looking for sponsors and helpers. And within three seconds of sending out that email, Brian responded. <laughs> and he said, do we call you, do we call you Brian? Is that your official? Mr. Ludmir, Mr. <laughs> okay. And, um, and so I got, three or four lines that said something about, I'm coming, I'm donating, and I'm speaking. And I thought, the nerve. <laughs> Chutzpah this guy has. <laughs> and then I checked with my colleagues, because I'm a California person, and I have to tell you, I'm, a, I'm an infant in terms of parental alienation syndrome. Um, uh, my, uh, I've been going through it with my, myself personally for about seven years, my, and my children too, my grandchildren. But um, actually as a professional, and I've been a parent ed professional for 40 years. <laughs> anyway, I am a newcomer. So um, uh, at any rate, uh, our folks who were at the Canadian Symposium last year were just awestruck when I said that I had been in touch with Brian. So he is a corporate and family law attorney, is that right? Okay, and uh, also an alienated father? Right. Was, oh my, okay. So um, at any rate, um, and, and enjoys helping families and uh, doing cons legal consultations throughout the North American continent, yes. Uh, and besides that, he, he's an excellent speaker, one of the excellent speakers, but an excellent speaker. And so uh, he is opening for today. I want to also tell you, before Brian comes up here, that, that uh, the subject is heavy duty. And laughing is fine and all that kind of stuff. But in the, it, it, you, you, you know, and and you're, you're going to be impacted, and some more than others, in different ways. Um, and uh, there are a few of us here who are mental health specialists. There's a colleague or a friend next, sitting next to you. Uh, we all understand, all of us, 100% of us understand what that's like, and um, that we do better together than isolating ourselves. So just know that you have a friendly person next to you, uh, it helps a lot. Uh, and uh, feel free to uh, even go outside and take a walk or, some, or breathe or whatever, whatever is good for you. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to, uh, inter I'm going to um, turn it, the mic over. Is the mic okay? Good, to Brian. Morning, everybody. Okay, um, my goal here is um, 
not to repeat uh, what you have. Everybody should have uh, this PowerPoint handout. Um, so that's your takeaway. What I want to do is try and give you a bit of a synthesized presentation of what the clients, the alienated parents, their family members can do to help those you're engaging help you better. Because we heard from our opening, each one of these stories is a sad saga um, with a long history and a lot of detail. And you can only imagine the opening phone call that most of us get where somebody that we've never heard from before just starts in a torrent to tell us their saga and some of them break down crying on the phone. I've never even met this person before. And that doesn't help us help you. Those of us in this field who have taken this on as a mission, we feel your pain. In my particular case, I successfully resolved it and that's what has me doing this despite 25 years of corporate securities law that I, I still try and keep alive as well. But we need you, we need to give you the tools so that your presentation of your family history and your case history comes across in an organized, synthesized way and touches on the aspects that sight unseen I know are in your cases that are relevant both for the differential diagnosis, are you a bad parent, did you cause this, did you contribute in a major way to this, or are you being victimized by the very dynamic that we're all here for. Secondly, those of us trying to help you need to articulate this back to judges and mental health practitioners who may not have the depth of knowledge that almost all of you have. You've all read most of the leading books in this area. And you're all very familiar, and there's today an immense amount of information on the internet. Some good, some not so good, but it's out there. So you come to the table quite armed, but your presentations are scattershot. And so what I'm trying to do here in this presentation is give you the tools to help us help you. And if you think at the end of the day that this is helpful, by all means, spread it around. Uh, my other presentations, um, uh, I believe the, the one Karen was speaking to was last year in New York. Um, and prior to that, there had been two Canadian symposiums in Toronto. Um, and about a year and a half ago, there was also one in Montreal focused solely on therapeutic remedies. So those materials, if people want to email me, are, are available as well. So that being said, I'll take you through this. And I'm, again, just going to take you through it at a high level because I want to get you off to your workshops as well. And I've, I've tried to give you... Um, they're fairly dense, these slides, so it almost acts like a paper. And if any of you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me. So I'll just have everybody turn because I don't have the actual PowerPoint here. So Canadian, eh? Um, those of you who are fans of the old Saturday Night Live uh, might be familiar with Bob and Doug McKenzie. Can I see a showing of hands? Is that, is that meaningful? Good, good. Um, so no, we're not all Bob and Doug McKenzie sitting around the campfire, um, but uh, we, do, we do say A a lot. And I guess um, I may be the international in the <laughs> international symposium that we're holding here today, so i um, proud to say that uh, I'm representing Canada here. We have made a disproportionate, I'll put it that way, contribution to understanding in this area, not because we're any more prone to this dynamic than you guys are, but um, we just do happen to have a lot of practitioners interested in this. So I'll have you turn to page three. And as Karen indicated, I'm a corporate and securities lawyer. I'm self-taught in a lot of these disciplines, and I have the very expensive library in my home office to, to show for that. And um, I was wiped out of my kids' lives in early 2005, and self-taught my way back in, today you would never know. You would, you would never know. As a matter of fact, I, I think I have better relationships with my kids than most of the people I know in intact families. So that biases me. 
because I approach every case with the attitude that it can be solved and it will be solved and it must be solved because I've seen it both ways. And, and I believe that's the attitude everybody needs to bring to these, but tempered by the realization that it is an intractable problem and um, most of our judges are a generation behind in their social sciences training. Most of the people acting, be it in the mental health world and in the legal community, don't have a clue. You guys are way more educated on this than they are. This is a highly specialized area of practice which is evolving very, very quickly, even over the period of time that I've been involved. And, and so we need specialized practitioners and we need conferences like this one. Karen also alluded to the fact that um, you know, you're, you're all here because you know about it and you want to solve it. These are very, very traumatic experiences. And so I always have this slide here um, from the matrix, which I, I'm going to assume that everybody is familiar with because you guys all had a choice. To, uh, to take the blue pill and not come here today and just shut it all out, but instead you're here to learn, to hear, to share, and, and to help conquer this. So as Morpheus said to Neo with a half smile, all I'm offering you is the truth, nothing more. Follow me. So on page four we have what um, is probably the leading uh, textbook devoted to this topic. This one was published in 2006 and the second edition, many of us, including myself, are writing our chapters for the second edition, which um, will be hopefully out at some point early next year. Um, whatever price this comes out at, priceless uh, when you think about the, and I can tell you on my part, the professional time that's going into working on this. My chapter will have a synthesis of jurisprudence right across North America on all the issues that come up in the cases and I don't want to tell you what the, the actual professional time cost would be because then I may break down and cry. <laughs> okay, our next slide are learning objectives. Some of you are getting your CPE credits and, and Karen informed me that, that part of the, the formal structure of that is there have to be formal learning objectives and at the end there's a pop quiz. So, uh, try, yes, yes, that's right, and I'm not going to use the Socratic method, but there has to be a pop quiz in the thing. So this is what we're going to try and cover very, very quickly so that I can get you off to your seminars. So flip over to the next thing. So what is parental alienation? You're here, you know, I don't have to go through it. But if you follow through to slide seven, remember that this is a dynamic uniquely arising in the context of a high conflict divorce. and what those who don't really understand the area miss every time. Child protection services, or as we call them in Canada, children's aid societies, therapists, they're applying their normal training and their normal criteria and their normal assessment practices to something that is uniquely arising in a high conflict divorce. And it's apples and oranges. You look at behavior of children and behavior of parents, and then you layer in, oh, they're in the midst of a high conflict divorce, and oh, there happen to be millions of dollars being fought about on the financial side, or financial issues that are otherwise disproportionate to the family's living standard, I get the idea. The kindling's there, someone dropped a match, and I need to look at the dynamic within that context. Everybody misses that all the time. This is different and every clinical assessment, every therapeutic uh, intervention, every court intervention must be done through the prism of what's happening, what's, what's the context of all this behavior. And so when you layer that in, it will color. You might look at something and say, could be this, could be that, could be that. But when you look at the broader context, you say it's probably deliberate behavior just as an example. Okay, now, the next slide, next couple of slides is just meant to give you guys some tools when you meet your next junk science person. Because the term parental alienation has a history going back well prior to Dr. Gardner. 
There are jurisprudence both in the United States and in England talking about this dynamic and using the phrase parental alienation in as far back as the early 1800s. So he didn't invent this. He didn't even invent the study of this area. There were many, many people that were kind of studying the dynamic. But he did make a major contribution for reasons that, that I'm going to let the other speakers speak to. Now, on the next slide, slide nine, this one always really troubles me because most of the resistance, the somewhat petulant, intellectually dishonest refusal to listen and hear and give it a chance, it might resonate with you, seems to be coming from the feminist world. And they are misguided because women are victims in every single case, every single case. At least half my clients are moms. This is a power dynamic, not a gender dynamic. The less powerful parent in the marriage is typically the victim in this dynamic. But even if the father is the direct victim, he has a mother. And that's usually not anybody that any mud is being thrown at. And the children were well bonded to the grandmother and now want nothing to do with her. And then you go on through the list. I was fortunate to have breakfast with Amy today, and she reminded me about the children. So add to this slide the actual female direct victims who've been turned against a loving parent. So women suffer in every single case. Oh, that's not me. OK, I've, that's happened to me before. And I'm looking around, whose phone is it? And then it was me. Um, so here, use this when you run into your junk science people. OK, next, next area of topic, the differential diagnosis. So we have some of the leading practitioners in this area here speaking to you today. So why do you have to know this? You have to know this because this is how you help us frame your case to help you better, to articulate your case for you. We ring out the emotionalism. We spot from amongst your family history the pearls and the gems that we're going to elevate in the discourse. And we're going to downplay some of the stuff that is really eating you up, and he did this or she did this, that is, is not directly relevant to the differential diagnosis or the treatment because you're well read and you understand it, but this is where we can add a little bit more. So if you can understand the criteria by which courts and custody and access assessors and therapists are themselves going to be judging and internalizing your story and better articulate it in light of the criteria, what they consider important in the differential diagnosis, you're gonna do better. In addition, by understanding what's important and what's not important in the differential diagnosis, you can help us take the squeegee and wipe away all the mud they're throwing at you because we can help you pull it together and say that's just a bunch of noise that in an intact family is considered normative behavior. So why did it just because you're separated? Oh, this is the reason why the children are so upset. Well, maybe they're upset, but do you think children in intact families don't get upset at a parent from time to time? Um, I, I want to share with you, because this also came up at my breakfast with Amy today, some of the language, because the rhetoric in this area is extremely important, and what I'm about to tell you, I bet almost all of you had in your own case or if you're clinicians in, in your clients' cases. So we often hear he or she is not listening to me and never listens to me. And in the extreme cases, what that means is I've told them I don't want them in my life and they keep coming back and they keep coming to my events and it upsets me to see them in the stands at my hockey games and it really, I'm gonna tell the school not to share any information with them. They're not listening to me. I'm telling them to go away and leave me alone. Well, if you did that, not only would that be perceived by that child as an abandonment, as, as 
circular as that seems to be. But they would be told by the other parents, see, I would never do that. I, 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 there's nothing you could do that would drive me from your life. So you're not supposed to listen to that. So that's number one. Number two, what, what uh, this doesn't listen to me? Well, we have this thing called parenting. And, and uh, it's something that an intact family, you don't need a license to do. You need a license to drive a car. You don't need a license to be a parent. And we just let you loose and we let you parent. And there's a very broad spectrum of behavior on the parenting side without training, without social work or psychology degrees, and whether or not you've written, you've read all the self-help books on parenting out there, there's a broad range of behavior that's normative and doesn't lead to dysfunctional children. Indeed, it will lead to well-balanced young adults. But somehow we nitpick you at a granular level over parenting behavior that's otherwise normative. And listening to children, a parent is supposed to hear children, but if you just listened and did what they said all the time, you wouldn't be parenting. So the language that I use in all my cases and, and what I demand of the aligned parent when they say I can't get them to go, parenting colloquially, and I've had judges recognize this, it's four things, guidance and boundaries, incentives and consequences. That's, those are the tools of parenting. So if you are deploying guidance and boundaries, incentives and consequences in a balanced way with quite a difficult child who doesn't want you around, I shouldn't be faulting your behavior, I should be lauding your behavior. So think about what it is that you're doing that I'm not listening or they're yelling at me. Well, I see that in all the cases. Well, are you yelling? And Dr. Childress has done a great contribution here because he points out in, in his materials that the way he would tackle that is, well, let's go back to the beginning and give me the entire sequencing of that entire visit because usually all you hear about is the last 30 seconds. And then you find out that at the end of the day it was normative parenting. But children in these cases, if you say no or I don't think that's appropriate or I'm sorry, 9.30 is the bedtime, that gets translated when they phone the child protection services because their parent is forcing them to go to bed and yelling and screaming at them. No means yelling. So you need to articulate the mud in a, in a way that helps us to articulate to the judge, to the custody and access assessor, cutting through the rhetoric that the child will use, because we see that in all the cases. And I'll give you a little anecdote from my own case. So this scene is probably taking place in March 2005, and my daughter, who is a wonderful, presentable, young lady currently in her third year of undergraduate to become, interestingly, a clinical psychologist, but I'll leave that to you, um, is, has locked herself in the bathroom, and I'm going like this, I'm just knocking gently on the door, come on out, let's talk. And this is being reported as I'm standing there, as he's hurling himself against the door and breaking it down, okay, <laughs> literally. Okay, so the children, when they go through this, massive distortions of reality being forced on them, but also massive distortions being fed back, I think she realized that I was just doing this. But that's what the other parent wants to hear. So you need to help us to translate. Because if a child protection worker happened to be interviewing the next week, was just, dad was throwing himself against the, the door, they're not trained in this. Well, just because the child said it, doesn't mean, and then, so you, you'll see how you do that in, in the coming slides. Okay, so let's keep going ahead because I, I wanna get you out to your, uh, your seminar. So I, I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on this. You're gonna hear about these next slides from everybody else. You need to understand that there is no current universally accepted diagnostic criteria for PA, whatever we're gonna call it. However, whatever we do have it's a hodgepodge and a, mi and a mixture of contributions by many learned people. Is very useful, has been tied back to the empirical evidence, and if you understand all of that and say, okay, so it's not one eight-factor definitive list, it might be 20 things that I need to speak to. 
These are the, the best 20 we're using today. Then do it. Then frame your own case conceptualization to me as your lawyer in light of those 20 factors. It will help me help you. The better clinicians you become in terms of understanding the tools of differential diagnosis, the better job your lawyer is going to be able to do for you. Okay, and so I won't dwell. You're all familiar with these eight factors, and Amy will speak to hopefully some of the work that she's done that, that's validated this. But if you... Okay. Well, we just met our first junk science person of the day. Okay, so if you go to slide 14. So this, this would be my own list, my own contribution from cases to what are some of the factors that really do help in the differential diagnosis and that, that courts and clinicians are, are listening to, seem to be saying, yeah, that's kind of important uh, in, in my own, because a lot of them aren't applying any differential diagnosis in a formalized way using specific criteria. Many of the custody and access assessors I've dealt with, they all have their own kind of templates and they write up their report and say, okay, well, that's interesting, but whose work is that? And they can't even articulate that. It's just their own, because they're not really studied in this area. The most important one is the first one, in my view, the disproportionate reaction. And always compare everything you're experiencing, seeing, hearing, to life within the intact family prior to separation. You might have been the disciplinarian in terms of the rules during the marriage. So you're the one who said, sorry, 9.30, that's bedtime. Sorry, that's just it. Well, that wasn't a problem necessarily during the marriage, but it became a huge problem after the marriage. And the children's reaction, you'll be reported as being rigid. And in all the books you've read, this is one of the things, targeted parents must avoid being rigid. And I'm gonna address that in a sec. So where, where, where the, and this is one of the things that, that Dr. Gardner did um, identify as a factor, but to me this is the most important thing. Would a kid in an intact family act like this over the issues that they're talking about? If the answer is no, you got yourself in, likely got yourself an alienation case. When we look at some of the tactics being deployed, the name changes, the adult issue triangulation, the step parent triangulation, and some of the other things on this list. You can really start to create this mosaic that takes you far down the path of your differential diagnosis. So time obviously doesn't allow me to explore all of this, but this is my list of some of the things that's relevant for your compiling your case history. Now, what's going on with the child? You're hiring mental health professionals or you're, you're going to seek mental health professionals, but it really does help if you're a little bit self-studied in the area in, in effect as I had to do. Because there's all kinds of stuff going on that ultimately uh, fa plays into the alienation dynamic but isn't just alienation. So I've, ru I've run into uh, parents who sit on the foot of their child's bed crying about the difficult hand that they've been dealt with, et cetera. And it, 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 right, remember, most alienators are consummate manipulators. And, and so we have a buzzword. There's a lot of psychobabble, right? You have to understand the psychobabble. We have a word for that, parentification. Making the child take on the parent's burdens as a tool of an unhealthy attachment. And our other speakers are, are, are gonna speak to that kind of thing. So without going through this whole list on slide 15, you do need to become a little bit self-taught about some of these issues because you'll likely see this in your case. And a parent who deploys crappy parenting and is parentifying the child is as guilty of the end result that child isn't going to see the other parent out of guilt that I have to stay with mom and protect her and et cetera, because mom is devastated every time. So you would, is that a hate-mongering case? No but it's achieving the same result, the destruction of the other relationships. So parentification, I don't care what the cause is, as long as we identify that your parenting is still normative. 
And so there's a lot of stuff that could be going on. So we have to be careful about the tools because generally we might say, yes, it's an alienation case in the, in the sense that the target parent isn't the primary cause of this. But instead of hate mongering as a subset of parental alienation, it might be a primary dynamic of parentification. It's just as bad. So you can help us help you by delving into some of these areas. Now, what of the aligned parents? So here I'm on slide 16, and I was a big Arnie fan, okay? So please don't, don't hold, hold that against me. Um, but um, the, your former governor of California, um, um, it just in, in the Terminator, they had the best description of the mentality of an aligned parent I've ever seen. And it's right here, okay? Cannot be reasoned with, cannot be bargained with, doesn't feel pity or remorse or, feel or fear, and absolutely will not stop ever, okay? That, despite all the learned clinical literature, in my view, is the classic definition of an alienator. So how do you deal with such a person? They're a fully baked adult. They can't change, they won't change. We have judges ordering them into therapy. Most of the jurisdictions have healthcare consent acts, so we have a problem legally in that we can't force a parent into therapy, but we can make cussing access contingent on them doing therapy, so it creates some problems. So our job is to constrain their behavior. They will never change. Okay, so I'm gonna really speed this up so I can get you into your workshops. You need to help us analyze the aligned parent, and you know the aligned parent very well. And it, just like there's different dynamics that could lead to the estrangement of the child, there's different deep-rooted things driving the aligned parent. You're not psychologists, but most of you are quite educated people, and if a corporate and securities lawyer can learn all this psychobabble, so can you. Help us frame your case by helping us understand what's driving the other side. Okay, slide, the next slide, slide 18 here. So as I said, we can never get through to the aligned parent, and, and the strategy, if your lawyer is telling you we're going to get them to change and we're going to get them into therapy, you have the wrong lawyer, okay? The idea is they need, they will, they don't even respect authority, they respect only one thing, the exercise of power. So they'll ignore court orders until they're found in contempt of court. Judge says, I will dispense my ruling on the costs award against you, sir, after I see how you do over the next six months repairing the relationships you broke. Have fun. That tends to work. Money. Okay? All right. So um, let's uh, flip. I'm going to have you flip ahead um, to slide 20. One, alienators always make key mistakes. Here's your advantage, slide 21. We challenge the aligned parent all the time, in my cases, to do the right thing. There's a family gathering, there's a birthday, um, it's time to try on, and I'd love to take Johnny out to buy his, and I'll save you the money, to buy his new hockey equipment, and we just keep like a bunch of blind, naive people making these offers, these helpful, hey, would love to do that, think Johnny would enjoy that, and we know they're gonna be turned down. And they are turned down, but we document it. When that goes before a clinician, and that goes before a judge, and it's all neatly compiled, I'm gonna show you how to do that in a sec, it resonates. That's how we get them. And why are they that dumb not to let you in the door a bit? because they worry that once that crack is open, the child will have an opportunity, just like we heard from our opener today, to develop an authentic experience, to recapture what was there. They're too afraid of that. And that's why they intercept all your emails to the child. I just had a case where for the entire year the child wasn't there, the child never got any of the emails being sent and thought that the targeted parent just was okay with them exiting. They intercept the emails, they change the emails. They deny the telephone access. They don't put you on the school register as the other parent. They want to control the information flow 
to keep the child in this cocoon where they can't develop the authentic experience. So if you document that and understand what they're doing and put it to the court and the custody and access assessor saying, mind control, and here you are. Here's, here's uh, tab one of the binder is the summary of all the things that they've done. And tab two are copies of all the emails that I sent that they didn't get. Tab three is really interesting because it shows the doctored email that the child did get and the actual email that I did send, okay? And that is one of your legal briefs, okay? All right, um, so let's skip ahead to 23. Admissions by the, your best witness is the aligned parent. You must be tape recording everything. And, um, and you do that, you don't have to share that with anybody. Generally the rule in Canada is if you're part of that conversation, you're allowed to tape. Okay, so you to the other parent. It might be different in the States, but in Canada, as long as you're part, yes? California, you can't, okay, okay. Yes? Okay, so California, you don't, you need consent. Okay, in Canada, so long as, yes? Okay, yes. Okay, well, so, all right. So I don't want to digress too much on this, but that's one of the tools that, that can be used. All right, so if you flip ahead, I take you through some of the logical traps in their case, and I'm going to take you all the way to literally some of the tools, the physical tools that you do. But just stop at slide 31 for one second. Because here's where the targeted parents really aren't being treated fairly. And after all the submissions you're going to make to the clinicians and ultimately to the court, there's a fundamental truism that even children, and this, this is what the other speakers will speak to is the splitting dynamic, when they resist any attempt at contact, any attempt to see you, any, it's over the top, I'm out of your life. There really is a very limited ability to say you're at fault for that. And I'll let the other speaker speak to that. And the other thing is, we're way too harsh, and this will be a part of my presentation I don't get to. We're way too harsh on targeted parents. The typical targeted parent is suffering some sort of post-traumatic stress thing. This is devastating. They're tossed into some vortex that they have no prior experience with. They may not be getting the right advice. They're in, there's nothing they can do right and everything that they can do wrong, and then we judge their parenting. Let's go back to one of my first comments. Without understanding the context of their own behavior. Okay, so the next section is how to assemble your case, and I'm really just gonna give touch on this so I can turn you over to your workshops. In the slides that follow this one, I go through a series of what we call briefs. What's a brief? It's a collection of documents on a common topic. You're gonna to have an email brief, and a, if, if it's permitted, a recordings brief, and then briefs on singular topics in your family. There might be a brief per child, showing all the school pictures and all the happy times with the child, and never showing a bonded relationship, undeniably, and then the precipitous cliff that pretty well speaks for itself. If there's no smoking gun in around the time that the relationship fell off the cliff, but there happened to be high conflict divorce going on at the same time, that makes it easy for me to make the case. So brief per child. Uh, uh, maybe hockey or extracurricular activities is a major focus of dispute in the family system. There'd be a brief on that. So by topic, copies of everything, organized and summarized with indexes. It is not helpful to me, the clinicians of the, or the court, if you give me a binder, here's 500 emails, okay? I would know what I'd be looking for. You don't wanna pay me to do it. It's too much, it's not of use to me. So you need to understand the differential diagnosis and build your briefs using the 80-20 rule. What's gonna help me articulate your case 
bearing in mind the differential diagnosis that I have to advance. And the, these, this next series of slides that I'll just leave to you, tell you how to do that. Um, slide 35 on collateral witnesses, extremely important. You give me a big list of people who are prepared to step up and give me affidavits talking to you as a parent, you as a person, your bonded relationship. I can do an awful lot with that. It's no longer he said, she said. Okay? We get schools. We get the therapists. In some cases, I have therapists who've been working with the family pre-separation. I get their notes. And you know what it says in there? Dad's alienating these kids from mom. And most of the other speakers here, I'm sure, would validate the fact that the roots of this alienation dynamic can usually be found during the intact marriage. It comes as a surprise when it blossoms afterward. But they're usually doing it during the marriage, okay? So that's extremely important. The whole strategy of avoid delay at all costs, move it forward inexorably toward a trial is extremely important. And then the last section that I'm not going to get to because I'm going to wrap it up now is all about what you can do for you. What to avoid. You have parenting educators here that will be speaking. Remember what I said, you don't need a license to be a parent. So I always like to put forward, hey, my client's doing everything they can. They signed up, they're taking two, three, four parenting courses. I put in lists of books. I have a library of parenting books now and that I give my clients for them to read, put in an affidavit, I've read these 20 books. So when you eliminate everything, you say, wow, here's a pretty educated person. They've done self-help, they've read parenting books, they took parenting courses, they have their own therapist, they've taken everything into account, they can't make any progress with the kids. Well, what does that tell you about the overall family dynamic? You got yourself an alienation case. So there's a lot of tools in here. I'm going to wrap it up now. And thank you for your attention. Feel free to follow up with me at any time. And uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. OK, thank you, uh, Brian. The presenter for workshop number one is Valerie Houghton. And she's sitting in the back over there. Workshop two uh, is, uh, let's see, that's Joshua Coleman. And workshop number three is uh, upstairs on the right landing. Don't go too far or, uh, no. <laughs> it's um, Jean Bickford. There's Jean in the back. And Jean's introducer will be, let's see. Thank you. Is that, I see a hand. That's Barbara. Barbara Kahn. Okay. All right. And the next one is uh, Craig Childress. Okay. There's Craig. Thank you. Dr. Childress, yes. Uh, workshop number five is uh, Jane Major, Dr. Jane Major. Hi. And who is introducing? And that is George. Okay. Um, Okay, and workshop number seven. Oh, by the way, uh, this is a good time just to take a moment because um, uh, Gerald Klein had some pretty serious surgery recently, and he has some pretty serious health issues, and uh, he sends his love, but he couldn't make it here. So um, at any rate, um, uh, send, send your, your good vibes and good thoughts in terms of Gerald, or give him a call if you know him. And uh, OK, so where there's no workshop six. So we had to disperse that workshop. Workshop, workshop seven is uh, Dr. Philip Koschel. There he is. <laughs> He's already standing up in the back. OK. And he is going to be here in the auditorium. And all right, OK. I'll see you after the workshops. Hear me okay? I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to tell you a little about uh, my personal story as well as my perspective on what I've seen in, in my case, as well as many other alienated parents who have shared their stories with me. I'm not an attorney, uh, I'm not a psychologist. Um, 
uh, I'm just a parent with uh, two children who are 10 and 7. Um, when their, uh, excuse me, when their mother and me separated in 2004, much has happened in their life and much has happened in mine. My daughter was 10 years old at the time, and uh, she was the most loving girl. My son was seven, and uh, he was just the sweetest little boy. Before my ex-wife and I uh, separated, she was a stay-at-home mom, and I worked. Uh, I coached my children uh, since the time they were four years old in soccer, uh, baseball, and softball. We had a nightly routine that was pretty normal. Homework, bathtubs, reading was customary. Uh, when my ex-wife and I separated in February 2004, it was like a flip of a switch. Every time I came to pick up my children shortly thereafter, sorry about that. Every time I picked up my children, um, it was just a battle just to get them in the car. And over the next number of months that turned into years, it became more and more uh, difficult. They became more angry. Uh, they became more defiant. And uh, it just became more and more difficult. They were confused. They were scared. Uh, they were even looking for reassurance from anybody, from me especially, that life was going to be OK the, the way it had been. I didn't understand. I had no idea what parent alienation was. I, I just couldn't believe that these were the very same children that loved me, were the ones being so angry and feeling uh, so much hatred toward me. I knew something was wrong, but I had no idea that bad mouthing and some of the things that, that happened could lead to such hostility in any children. They were used as weapons against me. Many alienated parents that I have met are ones that have taken the high road. They've worn the white hat. Um, and they've also seemed to be the one always on the defense, whether it's in a child custody evaluation or in a court of law. They're usually the passive ones, is what I've noticed. And uh, what I believe a, a targeted parent needs to do, and this is just my perspective, is to be a little bit more aggressive Still, still do the right thing and still take the high road, but to be a little bit more aggressive uh, and, and go about it through the court system, usually, um, if you can work it out with your ex, fantastic. My children went to therapy for, for five plus years, seeing three different ones, and not much uh, had changed. Everyone I knew kept telling me, just to, uh, just it'll take time. They'll come around. Uh, fortunately, my children have uh, done well in school, and they've kept out of trouble with the law. They haven't hurt themselves in any way. In 2007, uh, the world changed financially for uh, for me. I was earning significantly less, and I uh, told my ex-wife that she needed to go back to work for the first time in 12 years. So you can imagine, that didn't go over pretty well. Uh, six months later, my daughter turned 14, and my ex-wife gave her the choice if she wanted to continue visitation with me. At the time, I was seeing them twice a week and every other weekend. Sometimes, not even on my weekends, I would see them at their sporting events. So after four years of consistent visitation, it all ended. My son just followed along. And uh, so back to court, I went again. The judge ordered a 7.30 evaluation. My ex-wife wanted to move back to Colorado, said she couldn't afford to live here in Southern California if she had to work. Fortunately, the evaluator uh, said it was in the best interest of my children for them to stay in California. Uh, it was ordered that uh, my, my children seek another reunification therapist. And at that time, after four months, that therapist suggested that I take a break. I tried that for about six or eight months, calling, texting, sending cards, 
Once in a while I get a response, but after six or eight months I realized that was not the right path to go. So I had to go back to court again um, for the umpteenth time. The judge ordered a second 730 evaluation just last year. So now my children here six years later had been through two 730 evaluations, three different therapists, and the emotional toll, financial toll, uh, and the physical toll um, is just indescribable, as, as some of you may know. Uh, I have spent all my uh, retirement, my savings, um, in this battle. I recommend to all of you to stay healthy physically, um, whatever you can do to use a diversion uh, support. Friends will only, only listen to it so long. They don't know what you're talking about. They can only imagine. Obviously, a, a significant other like mine, Rebecca. My fiance is fantastic. My mother's here today. And they've been my, my rock. So, how does this happen? How does the system? court system, the legal system, the psychological, medical community allow a, a loving parent to be eliminated from wanting to love their own child. The use of temporary restraining orders, evaluations, delays, the remedies to enforce orders, sexual abuse allegations, these are all, all tools that are used by alienating parents, as I'm sure some of you may know. However, I, I'm here to tell you that it's been seven years and things are finally getting better. Just uh, a month ago, my, uh, my daughter, after visiting now her fourth therapist, began texting me and uh, we've been talking. Two weeks ago, she asked me to go to a lacrosse tournament in Santa Barbara. I saw her there and uh, had a chance to talk to her for the first time in, in two years. Because prior to that, when I would show up at her lacrosse games, I was ignored. I was literally ignored. Not even a hello by my ex-wife or either one of my children. I was non-existent, I was a ghost. So, just last week, she asked me to go to Arizona with her, spend the weekend at a lacrosse tournament and uh, take a look at the uh, Arizona State University as a, a college that she may apply. My son said, I love you, Dad, for the first time in seven years. <laughs> so I would just recommend to everybody, do not give up. Keep trying, because it will pay off. I think if you, don't, if you don't give up and keep trying, go to their sports activities, go to their graduations. They'll appreciate you were there. I remember in the last 730 evaluation, after spending three plus years of them shunning me, pretending I'm not there, the very first comment that they said in front of the therapist or in front of the evaluator in front of me was, where have you been in three years? So. They want to see you, even if they tell you they don't. I, I recommend showing up to everything you can. Because uh, deep down, they really want to see you. They just can't tell you that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dawn. Um, I have two teenage daughters, 18 and 20, and obviously, like everyone here, I'm a victim of alienation. Um, for people who believe in God or, or who, are, who are spiritual, they often go to church with their Bible, because that's the study guide that they use. Go through this sermon to get through life. <sighs> Sorry, I said I wasn't going to cry. I can't get through my life without this book. I have it highlighted, have it underlined, have pages folded down. And I think I'm losing my mind when I'm all alone. 
when my children are saying the most vicious, unkind, cruel things to me that are unwarranted. I can flip to many pages I know by heart in here. This is Amy's book, Breaking the Ties That Bind Adult Children of Parental Alienation Syndrome. And interestingly enough, this book is about the evolutionary process where we arrive at uh, a healthy place as best we can with the children that have been, we've been, have been maligned against us. However, what it also is is it's that whole journey uh, that the parent has to take. It's walking across coals uh, to get there. It's an instructional book on how to behave with your children when you do achieve some form of, form of closure. What I wanted to say was that, uh, my notes here, I don't have my glasses. I was married to this man for 23 years. Thank you. Oh, goodness, this will help. I was married for 23 years to this man. About 10 years ago, something very strange happened. As my children started to turn into young women, my two girls were like 10 and, and 12 years of age. Somehow or another, he began to see them as surrogate spouses. Up till that point, I had been the tooth fairy, Santa Claus, the Easter egg hider, the party provider, the boo-boo healer. Yet, as time would go by, every time there would be a positive female influence in either of my daughter's lives that was older, a more mature woman, they would say to that person, you're the mother that I never had. And this was all due to the constant bad-mouthing that was going on on the home front. I decided at that point I knew one day I would divorce this man. However, I was also aware that being the breadwinner, pretty much the family provider, I had to wait until my youngest turned 18. That was a torturous period of time for me where I had to actually see the alienation taking place where he would get each girl behind closed doors and I would hear intermittent laughter. One or the other would stick their head out and say, she's still here, I can't believe she hasn't left yet. It was the most horrific experience. It was such a terrible feeling of isolation. But I knew if I didn't wait till the youngest was 18, I'd not only be sued for my successful business, but child support as well, alimony, palimony. My youngest turned 18 in April of this year, so on January 2nd, I was at the courthouse applying for divorce. It couldn't go on the 1st. It was a holiday. So um, it's due to be final any day now. I moved out three months ago. What I could have never predicted was the alienation actually did, as it states in this book as well as other literature, it did become worse when I filed for divorce. Up till that point, my husband would weave a thread of reality through his complaints, for instance, look at your mother, she just had highlights done to her hair, yet I can't put gas in my car, and it never occurred to the children that maybe he should have had a job to do so. But then this magical thinking took over where when I filed for divorce, he told out and out lies. Your mother came in screaming and hit me today. And, you know, the children would come to me a few days later and saying, why are you abusive to dad? He said, you hit him. And I said, when? Well, yesterday, I did what time? Because I was at work all day. It's just, it's, it's a world that only those that live through it can understand. I honestly didn't think that I could find myself in the pages of this book where it pertained to hope, healing, and restoration. My situation was malignant. The relationship I had with my daughters was on life support. As I constantly worried that their alienating father would one day pull the plug for good on our relationship. In fact, where I stand with my girls today is a, on shaky yet hallowed ground as I work towards a re resolution and a rebirthing with them. Fortunately, uh, it's a new dynamic. It never stops, even when you reunite with your child, as this book says you can as they get older, as they look around them and they see their friends have all parents and they start to feel like maybe there's something that they've missed out on, not having two parents that they can mutually love and accept. There will always be setbacks. I can have a wonderful day where my girls come to the ranch I'm living on suddenly and we have a picnic and we carve pumpkins and we ride horses. Three days later, a mutual friend tells me, congratulates me that my oldest is in the Miss California pageant. Imagine you're the mother and you say she is. You never know what you're going to be excluded from. It could be that they could show up suddenly on your birthday, but then they don't invite you to their wedding the next year. I mean, it, it, it constantly plays on your feelings of 
ineptitude or guilt or lack of responsibility. It, it, but that said, it's a small price to pay for that one time when they do come up and they hug you and they say, I really do love you, Mom. Or you get a birthday card which says, I hope I get to grow up and be just like you. I wish we could meet like this every week. This is family. You can talk to the people here and they know the language you're speaking. Everyone else thinks, well, there's got to be something wrong with you. If, if a child doesn't gravitate towards their mother, there's got to be something. What is it? Did you abuse them? Only those of us that have dealt with an alienator, which is in fact a personality disorder, can understand how the tragedy of that loss and how all we can really hope for is to one day sort of regain our ground with our children. So as I'm hopeful as I move forward that with every year, with every passing special occasion, they're due to come out and spend Thanksgiving with me. I'll have a turkey. If they show up, great. If not, it's just one of these crosses I still have to bear. But at every moment, and as they tell me now, they're going to be over on Thanksgiving, I can rejoice in that. So there is hope. I know that there are parents here with young children, and it's just the most devastating thing. You can't see down the road ahead and understand that when they get older, when their life becomes more full of more experiences, when they look around, when they get to where they may meet someone that has a parental alienation system going on in their life, they'll say, you know what, that's interesting. That sort of sounds like what I lived with or what I experienced or what I saw. Or the alienator runs out of steam. I mean, they do get old, they do get sick. Sometimes they're not around to continue to perpetuate this. And it's during those brief moments that our children find their way back to us. So I just wanted to encourage each and every one of you today to not lose hope, to fight the good fight. Um, and as the other gentleman said, just keep showing up at their events. Even if you're not wanted, even if the children tell you that they don't want you there, even if they see you and they're upset that you're there, somewhere down the line that will have meaning to them. Thank you. I think that what is amazing and what is different this year than last year, aside from us being together longer and having uh, people in the group who have uh, successfully uh, or in the process of successfully re reunifying, is that we're going public. There was no compunction about sharing the stories that here amongst probably around 200 people, we can talk to each other as friends, we can look at each other in the eyes, people understand, and there's something about going public. P parental alienation, we know, is not new. But at any rate, I want to con especially congratulate the people who have uh, spoken willingly effortlessly and um, and to all of us who are listening and learning. So at any rate, uh, we have more of a program more of the program to go. Uh, there's a lot of feeling floating around in this room <laughs> I can tell right now. I was thinking that, I, I was looking at everyone today and I was looking at how you, everyone was interacting and talking to each other and have almost a hunger to talk with each other. So, and I was thinking how, about how, how nice that felt and, uh, and how then I said, let's just go with the flow. And so, um, because in the program I, did, I did left no time for eating, only for serving the food, you know? <laughs> So, at any rate, um, I thought maybe we could take uh, maybe a few minutes to, uh, to you know, and, and, and for those of you who, you can pass on this or you can, um, uh, you can try it out. I would suggest, of course, trying it out and being an adventurer. It's not, I'm not gonna ask you to do very much, but to look around the room and to, uh, 
he doesn't think it's such a hot idea. That's a, but, um, and, and decide on three people that you'd like to get to know better or that you don't know. And um, I'd like you to, um, when I tell you to do this, you, you're going to have about, I'd say about 90 seconds, maybe, maybe three minutes will do. And, you'll, and you will share uh, two important things about yourself that you feel comfortable sharing. And uh, the other person will react, and then you'll uh, change places, and the other person will share two important things about themselves that they want the other person to know. Uh, I would suggest that you get up and you, because we spent a lot of time sitting this morning, and uh, find somebody maybe across the room even um, who feels like maybe they won't be chosen. <laughs> yeah, like the like I was the last person on the on the uh, girls softball team, always at the end of the line. I was always yes. So uh, at any rate, what is your name? Minnie. Okay, remember Minnie. And um, make sure that Minnie, she's part of our community, right? Does anyone else, can anyone else relate to Minnie in terms of feeling maybe someone won't pick me? No. Good. Okay. Very good. All right. So, and if, and if, you, if need be, you can share with two people and not one. Okay? All right. But no one gets left out. All right. So, uh, I'm going to ask you to look around the room. Okay, and find that person and sit with them and share two important things about yourself. Okay, all right. So I want to know, what is it like to be interrupted when you just get started? What is that like? You, you can come up to the mic and share if you like, or just from your seat. What is it, what's it like to be stopped in the middle or just like, just as the going gets good. <laughs> what is that like for you? Are you thinking about it? I don't hear any answers. It's upsetting. It's upsetting. Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> you don't want to hear it? No, no, okay, all right. Okay, it's about unfinished business, maybe. Yeah, that's how it feels. It's unfinished. Some of that we experience with our children. Okay. I want you to think about something that touched you about the, uh, one of the people that you spoke with. Something that touched you about that person. Or learned about that person. This room is filled with treasures, let me tell you. <laughs> Do I see a hand? Oh, thank you. Yes. Can, excuse me, can you come up to the mic? Because it's really hard to hear. I'm Cindy Hirsch. This is my first time coming here. Um, I'm very touched by the two ladies that I shared with. Um, this is the... No. Faith and Ashley, I'm sorry. I'm not good with names and I'm in sales and marketing. My biggest faux pas. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I'm very touched, not only with them, with this whole room, but um, as they shared what little tiny bit they could before we had to be interrupted, um, I wanted to know them more. I felt connected to them. I felt um, enlightened by them um, and I felt not alone. And I felt there was a community just in sitting in this small room in, what, a minute we each had to share. Um, and I'm very clear that uh, I've been in a battle for nine years by myself. Friends and family have stood at my side, um, not being able to really understand me, but wanting to, frustrated to see my pain. And I come to this room and I feel like I'm at home. These are my friends. This is my family. And I was very touched, just the little bit I heard, we were like sisters. So thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, this time, somebody, something that touched you about one of the people that you chose to get to know better, something that touched you about that person, or something you learned. Maybe you didn't know the person at all and you found out about a talent or, yes. Yeah, please. See, once he gets used to the mic. <laughs> Can't get away from it. <laughs> um, well, I really only got to, inter well, interview, I guess. One person, this is Annie over here. And I could tell she listened, which to some, well, actually, almost all of us in here, we're not really used to. We're not used to being listened to. We are, the, we are ghosts to most people. And so being listened to, actually, you, you warm my heart doing that. And I can tell you right now, it's beating really fast right now. <laughs> but, and I, I think that you also got that, too, when you were enlightened by them. It's because they listen to you, something that we long for. Thank you. Someone else? Someone else that wants to share? Okay, come. Teresa. I'm Teresa, and this is my first conference. Um, but what strikes me when I speak with people is the incredible difficulties that we all face in our own individual ways, but the thing that I see the same is everyone really just trying their best. Everyone's doing the best they can with a very horrible situation, and the perseverance and the love that continues to shine through is what moves me about everybody here. I'm looking around the room and I realize that, oh, there's a, there's a hand. Yeah, I have a visual processing problem, I do. So I can't always see, you know, yeah, where? Oh, over here. <laughs> and you know, yes, go ahead. <laughs> I'm Linda Martin. Um, when I first walked in here, I could feel the grief in the room, the heaviness here. And um, as I was talking with my partner, I realized that, how can I say this? This is generations. We represent the tip of all these generations of families that have had so much pain. But the opportunity here is that we can become aware and we can break the cycle. So it doesn't have to go on and on and on as it has already. So I thank you all for the courage to be here and to become aware and to take responsibility for our own part, which is the only power I have is over my own life. And like the man said, to take care of yourself and do your part as best you can. Thank you. Thank you. 